There's a special kind of frustration with watching an obvious problem finally being acknowledged correctly, but then assigned a totally irrelevant fix, like an alcoholic or a drug addict finally admitting, yes, I have a problem, but then pledging to stick to a strict vegetarian diet to address it. Good for you, dude, but that's not really the central issue here. Except in this case, it's more like a drunk or a drug addict pledging to drink or smoke his way out of the problem. The solution isn't just unrelated, it's actually a self-rationalized relapse in disguise. But every problem can get so bad that even those knee-deep in rationalizing it eventually have to acknowledge and accept its severity. And if ever there was a city with such unignorable problems, it would be Portland, Oregon. It's not breaking news that this formerly beautiful American city's downtown decayed into the least talented public art exhibit ever assembled last summer, but of course, the problems go well beyond just the defacement of a federal courthouse at the city's heart. Already in early October, nearly three months ahead of schedule, Portland has set a new record for annual homicides, and that's excluding all those racist police shootings supposedly justifying some of this riotous behavior, and but for the grace of God, the record could already be much higher. There have been 969 shooting incidents in Portland this year, with 307 injuries in those shootings. In a city at least previously committed to defunding its police capacity, incompetence and luck may actually be the best emergency responders that you have. And so far, given the crime rise, they're doing an okay job. And these record murder numbers come in sequence right after homelessness records were set just prior. In 2019, Portland hit decade highs for people living on the streets, up 22% in just two years' time. And worse still, bums of color represented a disproportionate amount of those unsheltered. So today's Portland experience is more likely than ever to rank somewhere between tripping over a hobo and having him shoot you to death for disturbing his humble sidewalk abode. But on the plus side, it's also more likely to be a diverse experience. So, you know, not all bad. If you're gonna get killed, you'd certainly prefer the cultural enrichment. And that may sound absurd, but as we'll get to, that is actually pretty close to the city's real response to these issues. Oh, sure, there may be all sorts of problems, but isn't the diversity of the suffering what counts? However, in fairness to Mayor Ted Wheeler, yes, he has personally presided over the city's most significant decay, but he has had glimmers of self-awareness lately, moments of acknowledging the problems that eventually are gonna to have to be confronted. For example, he started the year by pledging to confront radical Antifa and anarchists whom he actually addressed by name this time, promising increased effort to prosecute these people. Later in the spring, he asked for citizen help in unmasking these thugs who are bashing, intimidating, and assaulting the city. And just this week, he's committing to hiring 300 more police officers in Portland over the next three years. Now, of course, that doesn't mean as much when the police shortage was at least in part Ted's own idea and creation. He was bragging about reallocating police resources only a year ago. And of course, you be the judge of the effectiveness as well. For all the shift in rhetoric, the shift in criminal behavior has yet to follow. But the point being that coming from a prior place of actually thanking the criminals destroying his city, Ted's evolving perspective actually does represent an improvement. And either through Ted's leadership, if you want to go as far as to call it that, or just through the harsh and undeniable reality of the city they've cultivated, the rest of Portland city government has no choice but to confront these truths too. Last week's undeniable demonstration for the city came hilariously in the form of a tourism report from Travel Portland, the nonprofit the city contracts to promote itself as a travel destination. It's a job that ranks right between ISIS press secretary and Jared Fogel hype man in terms of its PR difficulty. But while I am sympathetic with anybody trying to make the near impossible sale of Portland as an attractive travel destination, that doesn't mean that they're doing the best possible job either. The lone accomplishment of this presentation and report is correctly diagnosing the problem. The city councilman who serves as the travel liaison introducing the Travel Portland CEO sugarcoats nothing, at least to start. He says, we are a city known for homelessness and homicide. Today, a significant chunk of humanity is afraid of spending time and money in our city. Around the world, too many people associate Portland with homelessness and homicide. Was the problem the association with hobos and murder, or 
are the hobos and murder the actual problem? That's a point for clarification. But the Travel Portland CEO says the data shows exactly that. Major events and overall hotel bookings in Portland are being abandoned on a significant scale. Portland's specific issues related to civil unrest and public safety concerns has exacerbated the negative occurrences of declining attendance and group cancellations. While the region struggles with solutions to local safety concerns, the impact on meetings and convention in future months and years remains evident as Portland hotels continue to experience attrition and cancellations well into the future. The jobs that those incoming travelers support have decreased by the thousands. In 2019, uh, tourism supported about 36,000 jobs in the Portland metro area. In 2020, about 10,000 of those jobs disappeared. And of those still visiting, a rapidly increasing number of them respond to a survey saying, no, I am not likely to come back to this city. You can see here that in Q3, we saw significant drops in yes and a spike in no, I'm not likely to come back. And yeah, some of these declining numbers have to do with the corona insanity of the last year and a half that wrecked hospitality numbers everywhere. But when asked why they don't want to come back to Portland, corona infestation is not what these travelers cite. Instead, they cite homelessness and homicide. They say, I don't want to get in some knife fight with a hobo to try to protect my complimentary convention sack lunch. And I certainly don't want to play Minesweeper with Antifa dumpster fires either. Given the visibility of race and social protest in Portland over the last year, please rate the, the extent to which that impacts your likelihood of booking a meeting in Portland in the next 24 months. More than half of planners indicate their likelihood is impacted a great deal. Continued attacks and breaking of glass on buildings throughout the city, but especially downtown, continue to affect this hard to overcome sentiment. Okay, great. These aren't good problems to have, obviously, but clear data and honest diagnosis are the first steps toward fixing them. So what do you got? How do we fix this? Increased police presence or more prosecutors in the DA's office or maybe tougher penalties for offenders? No, of course not. The sensibility only extends so far in this city. So just like a drunk who thinks that a morning Bloody Mary will solve his issues, the city of Portland only has one conceivable solution to all conceivable problems. Diversity. Demographic checkboxes. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's a disabled Muslim transgender other kin of color. The first item on this meeting's agenda to address this issue was to introduce Travel Portland's new diversity officer. Sure, she's not even from Portland and she has no real knowledge of the city, but she does have the right skin color and genitalia for the job. At least I assume, but these days, I guess you never know. That might be a bigoted microaggression. I've been a lifelong Michigander, born and raised in Flint and college, spent my college and formative adult years in Grand Rapids. So moving to Oregon is my first experience living out of the state despite being well-traveled. DEI, social justice, and community building work is hard and often emotionally exhausting, but I'm eager to do the hard work. Well, even if social justice work is hard, Getting murdered is still a lot harder, and nobody cited racial injustice in your survey as their reason for not wanting to come to this city. Instead, they cited the violent iteration of exactly this clownish ideology. But the ideology shall not be falsified, and so every action and adjustment must be in pursuit of it. So the CEO says, sure, our hotel bookings may be cratering, but at least the remaining bookings that we do have are of exactly the sort of racial mix that our anti-racist ideology requires. Travel Portland's continual pursuit of diverse group bookings has translated into a successful lineup of future meetings and convention business. To date, future bookings total over 25,000 room nights, 15,800 convention delegates to Portland, and approximately $16 million in estimated economic impact. So to be clear, they have lost much larger events with tens of thousands of collective attendees and significantly larger revenues, but we're supposed to look at the bright side. Portland will have plenty of Hispanic nurses and Vietnamese med students to treat all those riot wounds, because as we know with the hobos, problems are always better problems when they're diverse problems. Speaking of, Travel Portland is also enhancing its doomed propaganda 
by making sure they hire the right racial demographics to produce it. We also identified three Black-owned firms with which we have contracted to produce videos and other content for our website and social media channels. Of those that we've hired back since the, our last meeting, 33% are from diverse backgrounds and 100% are women. And of the nine-member executive and senior team, three are of diverse background and five are women. Individuals are not of diverse background because an individual cannot individually be diverse. Unless you just mean not white, which normally is an accusation of coded language. In this case, it's not. Their presentation explicitly categorizes white and multicultural as two different and mutually exclusive things. It's weird that they let a non-multicultural guy like this even do the presentation. By their own reasoning, it'd be much more effective if they hired a presenter of color to do it instead, but this guy certainly did his damnedest to appease the diversity gods. The overwhelming majority of this presentation was about these racial issues, even though nobody responding to their survey is citing racial issues as their reason for not coming to the city. And the actual issues that they are citing, crime and danger, weren't even addressed until the very end of the presentation. Still, the reality of the data hit Ted Wheeler so hard that he suddenly became Mayor Joe Exotic. We are never going to financially recover from this. All right. Well, it wasn't uplifting, but I didn't expect it to be. I think what's more interesting is your data starting to tell us how long it's going to take to recover the reputation. There's an old, old saying that it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and you can ruin it in an instant. And that's true of cities as it is people. And to his credit, Ted acknowledges his own role in that damage. It never ceases to anger and frustrate me that a bunch of kids with hammers can damage an age-old positive reputation of an incredible city. But they can, particularly in a media environment where every single broken window becomes a national story. And when they happen en masse, as they did just a couple of weeks ago, it's deservedly a national story. And so that's on us. That's public safety. But he hedges with the delusion that other cities are suffering similar fates because of national social justice issues. I also appreciate, Jeff and Angela, your acknowledgement that a lot of what we're seeing at the street level here in the city of Portland was neither created by nor can it be solved by Portland alone. There are some societal issues here as well. But that is not at all what the guy said. The guy said that Portland is especially terrible. He said other cities are recovering just fine, but Portland is not. In fact, Portland is losing only to San Francisco and Minneapolis in the competition for America's least accommodating city. Our central city occupancy in September lags every competitive city we track except Minneapolis and San Francisco. Recovery is happening elsewhere, just not here. Ted is right about one thing, though, and it calls into question the entire purpose of this travel Portland agency. You can make fun of the racial propaganda all you like. It's obviously not good, and it obviously won't work. But the truth is, there is no propaganda powerful enough to persuade people against the reality of this city's decay. If public perception of this city is ever to recover, it'll take not just telling people that Portland has changed, it'll take showing them. We're not ready for marketing. I'm not saying stop your marketing, but right now people don't buy it. What they want to see is results. They want to see action. Right. So that means spending the money on the action of cleaning up the city and stopping the crime and saving the money on the propaganda because the propaganda can be done for free just as effectively, if not more so. At this point, an actual Babylon Bee parody poster is much more likely to bring people to Portland than the sacrifices at the diversity altar are. A tour of the ancient ruins of a once beautiful American city is a more attractive selling point than racially segregated interest group conventions. And ironically, it's a lot more inclusive too. Then again, if ever there was a less convincing sales pitch than visit Portland, become a police officer in Portland is it. So. Good luck with that, Ted. That's another predicament from which you will never financially recover because there is no check big enough, no matter how multicultural the signature is. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab that is at M. L. Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Come on.